NES Tetris does not play well with extremely high levels. First of all, we have the crash, which I've explained before, but there's several other pieces of behavior that I'd like to go over today. Let's talk mechanism for a moment as a refresher. To put it briefly, the scoring code in NES Tetris is inefficient, enough so that at high levels, the frame is overloaded. Graphics can only be updated in between the drawing of frames on screen, so a signal is sent at the end of every frame which interrupts the processor and runs the graphics code. This is called NMI, short for non maskable Interrupt. Normally, NMI happens after the game code is already finished running, but at high levels, the delays in scoring mean that it triggers during the game code. So the crash is a result of one particular set of times that NMI can trigger during the switch routine, but I've already discussed that in my crash video, so let's talk about all the other places NMI can trigger. The next trigger of interest is what we call confetti. This is a result of NMI triggering during the next preview sprite staging. Let's take that apart. The staging routine sets up the sprites to be drawn to the screen quickly later in the frame. Because NMI is so short, it's best to get the work out of the way while things are being drawn, and then have less to do later. The game has a table containing sprite data for all the pieces, and the first thing the routine does is figure out which part of that table to load from. It writes down the address of the correct part of the table to the memory addresses A8 and A9. Here's the problem. Both of those are overwritten during NMI. A8 during code to write numbers to the screen, and A9 during the controller polling routine. This means that after the interrupt, it starts reading sprites from the completely wrong part of memory. That part of memory depends on what's left behind from NMI. A8 being tied to the numbers on screen is last affected by the drawing of the max out score to the screen, and will always be the value 99. A9 will contain the buttons currently held on the controller, which is 00, zero unless you're, you know, holding buttons. As a result, the game loads sprites starting from the address 0099. Now, the number of sprites it loads isn't specified in the code, but is instead stored in the table as a terminator byte of FF to indicate all sprites have been loaded. Each sprite is encoded in 4 bytes, and it checks the first byte for the FF terminator. Until it hits that terminator, the sprite staging routine will never exit, and it will continue pulling more garbage sprites from every fourth address between 0099 and 0198, creating the characteristic random on-screen tiles. Typically, none of these addresses contain an FF. However, one of them is the game's internal frame counter. When that frame counter hits 255, the confetti exits because the Terminator was finally encountered. There is another way to exit, though. The A9 address still contains the controller output. Therefore, by pressing buttons, we can change where it loads sprites from, and possibly get it to hit a Terminator. Two buttons work for this, the A button and the select button, which both direct the routine to a part of memory that happens to contain an FF. This exits the staging routine, and the game can finally proceed. Because this confetti exits on its own, we call it limited confetti. However, you can extend it if you want, since the controller lets you direct it pretty much anywhere in memory. Holding B, down, left, or right all entirely prevent the confetti from ending. The reason we call it limited confetti is that it's not the only kind of confetti. If we move further back on the frame, we get to the sprite staging routine for the current piece, which is written differently. This too creates confetti when interrupted, but it doesn't function the same way. It doesn't end on its own. In this routine, the number of sprites load is specified by code. The problem is that it's specified using a decrementing counter at, wouldn't you know it, A9. As I said before, that address gets overwritten during the controller pulling routine. But if you're not holding anything, well, wouldn't you expect 00, zero to be written to that counter? And wouldn't that end the routine immediately? Well, the problem is that the last command in the routine is to decrement the counter before checking that it's 0. So by setting it to 0, we actually maximize the number of times the routine runs, because it gets decremented to FF, and proceeds to run another 255 times. But this shouldn't be a problem, right? It should run 255 times and exit. Wanna guess when NMI triggers again? On the 255th loop of the sprite staging routine. I could not believe it when I saw it on the debugger. Anyways, because it's on such a tight margin, literally pressing any button and any combination of buttons exits the confetti, because sending the counter to anything other than 00, zero means that it can and will finish. Going back further in the frame takes us back to the scoring loop that puts us in the situation in the first place. What happens if the scoring loop is interrupted? Something interesting, actually. The score calculation loop for its consecutive addition uses the counter at A8. This is the one that gets clobbered by the draw two digits routine, which was used to draw the score last time. But now, the game didn't finish calculating the score and hasn't set the flag to draw it yet. So 99 isn't going to be the output. No, it's actually going to be the current line count the bottom two digits of it, and it's actually going to be the old line count, which is going to require a tangent for a moment. In the NES Tetris memory, there are two copies of most of the game variables, such as lines, level, and score. One copy is the working memory, and the other is the player one memory. 
The game was programmed with two player functionality in mind, so all the calculations are programmed to use the working memory and then copy the results back into the player memory. That way, you can transfer both player 1's and player 2's info into the working memory one at a time, run the same code for both, and transfer them back. So after all the calculations happen, the game in this case has to transfer the working memory into player 1's memory. This step happens between the two confettis, meaning that in our situation here, it has not happened yet. Importantly, the NMIA code assumes that it has already happened and loads everything it needs from player 1 memory, which is out of date. Okay. Back to where we were. The last thing drawn to the screen will be an out-of-date version of the bottom two digits of the line count. So that's going to be used as the number of times to run the scoring loop, which means that technically, under an unmodified version of the game, the scoring above certain levels is actually dependent on the line count instead of the level. For singles, the point value should be 172, as was interrupted during its 172nd loop, plus the line count read as hexadecimal times 40. Of course, scoring in the vanilla game is locked at a max out, so it hardly makes sense to act like these bugs matter for scoring. I don't expect anyone to use this information, but I find it really fascinating to know not even the score works properly from the 170s onwards. Oh, and ending in 0, 0 means 256 loops, so the most points you could possibly score is the Tetris on a level with a double zero in your line count. Tetrises are interrupted in their 184th loop, so the score in that circumstance would be a truly staggering 528,000. It actually takes three frames to run this. The scoring routine is interrupted a second time before finishing. But in that case, nothing is drawn to the screen and the counter is preserved. Otherwise, the game would hard lock in the 180s with no hope of passing.